Good morning, everyone. I am Pat Matthews, Associate Dean for Academics in University College. Welcome to the final talk in our MLA lecture series. The Master of Liberal Arts, or MLA, fosters intellectual breadth through courses that address a range of issues from different academic disciplines. In the same spirit, the MLA lecture series considers a theme from diverse perspectives in hopes that each conversation enriches the next. A bit of logistics before we begin. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. You can submit questions at any time, and our speaker will field these at the end of the talk. You'll also see a chat button, and you can post technical issues there. Our theme this year is unprecedented times. We've invited distinguished faculty members to speak about their research with the knowledge that our unprecedented times will be a lens through which we see their work. Historic levels of civic protest over racial injustice, an assault on our nation's capital, and a pandemic that has now reached the one-year mark in the U.S. justify the qualifier unprecedented. At a recent annual health screening, a nurse asked me if I was feeling depressed, quote, other than due to COVID. Apparently, that is too common to be noteworthy. Youth have been hit especially hard, and so I'm grateful to today's speaker, Deanna Barch, Chair and Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences, Professor of Radiology, and Gregory B. Couch, Professor of Psychiatry. Professor Barch is a clinical scientist whose research focuses on understanding normative patterns of cognitive function and brain connectivity, and the mechanisms that give rise to the challenges in behavior and cognition found in illnesses such as schizophrenia and depression. Her work utilizes psychological, neuroimaging, and computational approaches. She has authored or co-authored over 600 articles, and her prolific work has been cited more than 65,000 times. She is deputy editor at Biological Psychiatry and editor-in-chief at Biological Psychiatry Global Open Science. She's also the incoming president-elect of the psychological section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In addition to serving on a number of national scientific boards and national society committees, she is a fellow both of the Association for Psychological Science and the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, a member of the Society for Experimental Psychology, and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Her talk is entitled, Early Onset Depression, Causes, Consequences, and Treatment. From your home, please welcome Professor Deanna Barch. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I do truly wish it could be in person. Let me share my screen and get my slides going. Um, and as Pat said, um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end, so please put any questions um, in the chat box. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the work that I and my colleagues have been doing trying to understand uh, early onset depression. So depression that onsets in the preschool or school age era uh, in uh, children and trying to understand causes, the kind of the consequences and the treatment options that might help children who have this kind of depression. Now, we know that the developing brain is truly powerfully influenced by a variety of psychosocial factors. Uh, we know that what causes people to develop depression certainly has some genetic con component, but also brain development and behavioral development is powerfully influenced by deprivation and nurturing early on in life. And we know that parental support even decontrols some of the forms of gene expression that influence brain development. So even when things have a genetic contribution, the environment in which a child is growing can actually uh, modulate or control the expression of those genes. And we know that these psychosocial forces can have a very, very powerful impact early in development. And some might even argue that they have their strongest impact early in development. Now, sadly, we have come to learn that depression can arise as early as age three. Um, it all too frequently continues on into later childhood. So children who have depression early on are at an increased risk of continuing to have depression later on in their life, school age, adolescence, even into adulthood. 
Um, and I'm going to show you some data about this, but we are uh, coming to know that depressed children can have very similar brain differences or changes as what we see in depressed adults, suggesting that it's really sort of the same form of depression or on a continuum across early childhood through to adulthood. We also know that depression can run in families, though it doesn't always, and it can be a chronic and relapsing disorder. Although I don't want to be pessimistic, there are some people who have depressive episodes, you know, and don't go on to have another one, but all too frequently we see that depression is chronic and relapsing. So people will continue to have multiple episodes if they don't have adequate treatment. Now, we also know that depression is often very difficult to treat later in life. Although we have effective treatments, many people do not respond fully or they may relapse and need further treatment. And I think there's reason to argue that maybe early treatment might be even more effective than treatment that happens later in life. And one of the reasons I think this is true is that if you think about what early treatment can do is it might be able to sort of shift a child back onto a healthier developmental trajectory such that they can experience a lot of positive things during development that might give them greater support and resilience as they go into adulthood. Um, if you have a child who's having early depression and is spending much of their youth you know, experiencing depression, you know, that is in some ways a lot more that you have to work on treatment later on in life. And, you know, that way you can think of early treatment perhaps heading off negative outcomes of early depression that might start to unfold in adolescence or early adulthood or even later in life. I, I'm imagining some of you are thinking to yourselves, well, what does depression in childhood look like, right? Because you may have either personal experience or experience with a family member being depressed and have a sense of what that looks like when someone is an adolescent or a young adult. But don't really have a good sense of what that might look like in a child. And again, sadly, it looks in some ways very similar in a child, but in a sort of developmentally appropriate format. Meaning that, you know, depressed kids often feel quite bad about themselves. They think things like, I'm a bad kid. Uh, they think that, you know, people don't like them. No one wants to play with them. They uh, think of things like, I wish I was never born. And, you know, we even start to see some suicidal ideation in very young children. Um, they often have what people refer to as anhedonia or a loss of joy or pleasure. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that because we think that that's a really critical component of early depression. Um, and then they also can have a lot of guilt, um, you know, feeling so bad that they think feeling like they're to blame for bad things happening to their families. Um, so many of the same kinds of things that adults experience, but in sort of a format that you would expect to see in a child. Now, one of the things our program of research has been doing is trying to understand whether early childhood depression is associated with some of the same changes in brain uh, structure or brain function that we see in adolescents or adults with depression. And we have had data from a, a long-standing longitudinal study that my colleague Joan Luby, who is a child psychiatrist here at Washington University, started back in 2002, where she recruited children um, who had early signs and symptoms of depression, as well as children who did not. And we have been following these kids um, uh, for over 17 years now uh, and in trying to kind of understand what life is like for them and how life is evolving for these kids who had early depression versus kids who did not. And so we had assessments of depression starting back in 2002 and then annually for many years after. And then when the kids entered about school age, we started to do brain imaging with them so that we could look at the shape and size of their brains. So we started scanning them when they were about uh, eight years old, as I said, and uh, have been scanning them over time to look at changes in brain development over time. And one of the striking things that we have seen is that children with the most severe early depression do seem to have differences in the uh, size and shape of their brain over time. So I'm gonna focus uh, just globally on something called gray matter. So this is uh, three different images of the brain. This one is as if I sort of sliced through my brain this way and you were looking down on top of my brain. 
this one would be like if I sort of sliced off my face and showed you the inside of my brain. And this one would be if I split my brain in half and you could look at me from the side. So this is the front of the brain, the back of the brain, bottom, top, front, back. And these darker colored pieces here are what we would call gray matter. And those contain all of the neurons that allow your brain to do the information processing that allows you to think and speak and experience emotions and you know, perceive other people's emotions. And then the, um, the white parts involve the connections among different regions of the brain. And we looked at the size overall of this gray matter in the brains of children who had very early onset depression. And what we saw, and I'll unpack this slide for you, is that if you look at children who have low depression, um, we, they started out with the largest brain volumes at the first scan. And every child, this is just a normal pattern of development, will show a decrease in gray matter volume over time. This is thought to reflect the brain starting to specialize as we learn about uh, you know, how to interact in the world and brain regions become more specialized and we get rid of connections in the brain that we don't need anymore. That's a very typical normal pattern that we see in everybody. And so you can see children who had low depression started out with higher brain volumes. They showed a decrease over time, but children with high depression not only started out smaller, but showed a bigger decrease in brain volume over time. Um, and it was basically the more severe the depression over those early years, the more we saw this pattern of starting out smaller and showing a larger decrease over time. And I think that's you know, important. And one of the reasons we wanted to look at this was when we first started doing work on early onset depression, a lot of people said to us, well, you know, this is just, it's transient. It's not really important. Kids really can't feel depression. It's not so meaningful for their life. And that was very different than the clinical picture that we were seeing of kids who were depressed and had you know, depression that lasted over years. And here we're showing evidence that it's actually associated with differences in the brain as well. Now, we can't from this data say for sure that the depression caused these brain changes, but it certainly suggests that there are associations to differences in the brain that kind of support the idea that this early childhood depression really is on the same continuum as depression that's experienced later in adolescence or adulthood. Now, in addition to just differences in the shape and size of the brain, we're starting to learn a lot more about the more specific behavioral and brain systems that seem to be disrupted among individuals who experience depression. So here I'm showing you a schematic of the brain, and I'm going to tell you about some of the brain regions and behavioral systems that we think are disrupted in people who experience depression. So one of the things that we know is that people who experience depression can have disruptions in what people have referred to as the negative valence system. This is increased activity in brain regions that respond to negative information. And one of those regions in particular is a region called the amygdala. And this is a region of the brain that will get very active when we are experiencing things that are threatening or frightening, but can also be very active when we are experiencing sadness, uh, loss, those sorts of things. So we know that people with depression experience increased brain activity in these kinds of regions in response to negative stimuli in the environment or negative information. The other thing that we know can be disrupted is activity in systems in the brain that help us regulate our emotions. So, you know, all of us experience depression, anxiety, fear at different times, but we try to regulate those emotions. And there are brain regions, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, that are thought to be important for helping us to exercise that sort of top-down control over emotion. And there's growing evidence that people with depression can experience disruptions in the activity of these brain regions that are important for emotion regulation and may have more difficulty engaging in effective emotion regulation. The other thing we know is that there's often disruptions in the connections between these brain regions that are involved in emotion regulation and brain regions that are involved in generating emotional responses. 
So in order for us to be able to effectively regulate our emotions, there has to be a communication of information between brain regions that are involved in regulating emotion and those brain regions that are generating emotion. And if you have disruptions, either in terms of the structural connections between these brain regions, the white matter connections, or what we refer to as the functional connections between the two, that can also make it difficult for you to regulate your emotions. What I'm gonna focus more on today though, are disruptions in what people have referred to as the positive valence system. So this is the fact that people with depression can experience reduced activity in regions that respond to reward and pleasure. Um, now, it's more complex than it being a single brain region, but one of the brain regions that has been associated with this kind of responding or anticipating reward and pleasure is the striatum. Um, and we know that individuals with depression can show reduced activity in regions like the striatum when they're thinking about or anticipating or experiencing things that we would normally expect to be pleasurable or rewarding. Now you might say, why am I gonna focus in particular on positive valence? And I think for those of you who have had the opportunity to spend time with young children, preschoolers, um, one of the things that's so salient about being with a healthy young child is their sort of unmitigated joy in life, right? Um, you know, today is gonna be somewhat nicer weather. I can guarantee you there's gonna be tons of kids running around outside today, playing hopefully with, you know, say friends um, and, you know, just watching such children, you know, having joy and pleasure. Uh, there's a task that we use in the lab called bubble popping task where we blow bubbles and let kids pop them. And it's so fun when you do this with kids who are not depressed because they're just running around popping the bubbles, having a great time. But one of the things that's so striking about young kids with depression is if we do the bubble popping task with them, they don't seem very excited about popping the bubbles. They really seem to have, uh, I, I don't wanna say loss because that implies they can never recover it, but at least while they're depressed are not experienced that kind of joy that we think of as so characteristic of childhood. And we think that this may be one of the really key features of childhood depression and something that may be really predictive of how these kids do over time. So I'm gonna to focus today more on our work looking at positive valence systems, although we've also done work on children experiencing, you know, increased responses to negative information and having difficulties with emotion regulation and connections between brain systems involved in emotion regulation and those involved in experiencing or generating emotion. Now you might wonder, how do we study this in children? Well, we use different kinds of safe, non-invasive brain imaging techniques that let us look safely at activity in the brain when children and adults are engaging in different tasks or experiencing different things like pleasure and reward. Uh, so one of the techniques we use is called functional magnetic resonance imaging. It uses the same machine that probably many of you have been in if you've ever broken a limb or needed a certain kind of scan, it's called an MRI, but we can use it in a slightly different way to actually look at people's brain activity when they're uh, doing different tasks and experiencing different things. So one of the tasks that we use is a kind of a very simple, uh, we call it the gambling task, but it's not really gambling. So it's a really simple task, even little kids can do it. Um, we just show a question mark on the screen and we ask kids to guess whether a card that they're gonna see is gonna have a number higher than five or lower than five. So they're just guessing, higher than five, lower than five. So they make their guess, and after they make their guess, they get a cue that tells them what the likely outcome is. So one likely outcome is they're not gonna win anything. Another outcome is, well, we don't know. It could be either you win something, you could, and we've done this with money, and we've done this with candy, um, or you might lose. It could be the likely outcome is, oh, you're not gonna win anything. In fact, you might lose some candy or money or the likely outcome is that you're gonna win something. So if you focus on this condition here, this is what we call anticipating cues of winning. And this would be anticipating cues of losing. So this looking at brain activity in response to these cues lets us look at brain activity 
uh, that's occurring when, when kids are anticipating whether they're going to win something or lose something. And like I said, we've done this with money. We've done this with candy. We get very similar brain responses in either case. After they see this cue, they then actually experience the outcome. They either win money or candy. They either lose money or candy, or in some conditions, nothing happens. And so this would be looking at brain activity in response to actually getting an outcome of reward or not reward. Okay, so we're measuring brain activity while people are doing this task, while kids are doing this task. And what I'm going to show you is brain activity that occurs when people are thinking about cues that tell them whether they're likely to win something or lose something. All right, uh, this is work spearheaded by my graduate student, Brent, so I always like to show their pictures. Um, so this is a picture of actual brain activity that's occurring in the brain of kids when they are doing this task. Um, so just to remind you about these images, um, this top picture would be like if I sliced my head here and you were looking down into my brain, front of the brain, back of the brain. And this picture here would be like if I sliced off the front of my face and took off my face and you were looking inside my brain. Um, and this is the skull on the outer part here. This darker gray part is the gray matter, and this white part are the white matter connections or the synapses connecting the neurons in the brain. Oops, sorry about that. And the green part is how we represent brain activity that's occurring at different points in time. So here in particular is brain activity in the striatum. This was the brain region I mentioned before that is very active and helps people process information about reward and pleasure. So this is brain activity that we see in response to cues that you are likely to win a good outcome, money or candy. So we can ask, how does activity in these brain regions in response to these cues about anticipating rewards change as a function of how much depression a child has experienced? So that's what I'm gonna show you now. So this is a graph. What I have plotted here is the kind of cumulative uh, severity of depression symptoms over those multiple early waves that we measured in these kids. So higher numbers here means that they've experienced more cumulative depression over preschool and early childhood. And then this graph is basically the degree of brain activity in these brain regions. And what you can see here is that the more depression that a child has experienced, prior to doing this brain imaging task, the less activity they show in these brain regions in response to cues that predict them winning rewards. So less activity in brain regions that we know are important for processing information about future rewards and pleasurable things. Now, we can do brain imaging studies with fMRI um, fairly easily in kids who are seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Um, it's a little bit more challenging to do when kids are even younger, four, five, and six years old. But we have other ways of measuring brain activity that are easier for these even younger kids. Uh, and that's uh, using something called uh, EEG or electrophysiology, which measures electrical activity being generated by neurons on the scalp of the brain. We use even simpler tasks to do this. So to do this, we use this, it's called the doors task. And it's not surprising it's called the doors task because we just show kids two doors and all they have to do is pick one of the doors and they'll either win points or lose points. And prior to doing the task, we have a whole prize pantry set up in our lab and we show kids all the different prizes that they can uh, pick out depending on the number of points that they win. Um, and at the end of the task, they have a bunch of points and they get to go take their points and pick out whichever prize they want. Um, and if any of you have ever taken your kids or your grandkids to a place like Chuck E. Cheese or one of those other places where they win a bunch of tickets and then they go get to pick out prizes, you'll know that this is a pretty motivating thing for kids. They really enjoy being able to earn their points and being able to pick out prizes if they're not depressed. Um, so we can then measure brain activity when kids are doing this kind of task. Um, so this is what the setup looks like for our EEG system. So we have caps uh, that we put on kids' heads. Um, 
they get a little game controller, play the game. And then the, we have uh, safe electrodes that we stick on the caps that let us measure electrical activity on the surface of the scalp. And we can make inferences about what parts of the brain are generating that electrical activity that we see on the surface of the scalp. And kids generally really like to do this. Um, you know, the caps don't hurt. They're kind of fun. They like to see the whole setup. And we can do this with kids as young as three, although it's much easier with four, five, and six-year-olds. All right, so what happens when we do this kind of brain imaging? Well, when we do this kind of braiding, we can look at the kind of patterns of electrical activity across the brain. So let me show you an example first in healthy kids who don't have depression. So these dots here represent where those little electrodes are. So if you go back to this here, right, one of these is represented by the dots here. And the colors here re reflect the sort of amplitude of electrical activity on the scalp. So when it's a warmer color, like yellow here, we're getting a stronger positive activity on the scalp. And this is showing you the difference between brain activity to uh, getting information that they want to reward versus not having won a reward, having actually lost. And so the warmer colors here on the back of the scalp indicate that these kids without depression are showing greater brain activity when they get information that they've won something versus when they've lost something. Now, what happens when we look at the brains of preschoolers, right? So now these are four, five, and six-year-olds with depression. And what you can see is that the colors are much cooler on the back of the scalp here, meaning that they are showing less brain activity in response to uh, being told that they're going to win something versus losing something. And if you directly compare these two groups of kids, so if you look at how much brain activity the healthy kids are showing, for rewards versus loss versus the depressed kids. So PO stands preschool onset major depression. You can see that the healthy kids are showing um, much more brain activity to those cues that they're gonna win versus the kids with depression. Okay, so two different examples. We have a number of other studies uh, showing you that uh, kids with early depression show less brain activity in response to rewards. Uh, we could look at different kinds of behavioral measures of that, and we also see that you know parents will tell us that their kids are less responsive to reward, less enthusiastic about positive outcomes, show less joy and pleasure. If we have them do various games in the lab, we see that in their behavior as well. So pretty consistent evidence that these kids with early depression are not experiencing joy and pleasure in the way that you would expect for kids their age. <clears throat> All right, so what do we try to do about that? Uh, so one of the things that I've been really fortunate to do in collaboration with my colleague, Joan Luby, is to actually get involved in studies that are trying to target uh, treating these kids with early onset depression. Um, and again, as I said earlier at the start of the talk, you know, while we do have treatments that can be helpful when people are older, right, as much as possible, we want to try to intervene as early as possible so kids can spend as much of their development not being depressed as possible. Because when you are depressed as a child and you are withdrawing into yourself, maybe you're not engaging with your peers, you're not, you know, maybe you're having difficulties at school, you are not getting to experience some of the important developmental activities and experiences that are going to shape your development in a positive way, right? So we really want to try to think about how we can sort of shift development back into a positive trajectory. Um, and, you know, there's been really, frankly, much less work on uh, treatments for kids uh, with depression or, or really most forms of mental illness. Um, partly that's due to the fact that you know, we really do not think of medications as a first line treatment for kids. There are certainly some challenges that kids have for which medications might be important and very helpful, uh, but that is generally not something we are recommending as a first line of treatment for kids with preschool depression. Um, so instead trying to look at whether there might be psychotherapy approaches, particularly those that engage the family that might be helpful for kids with depression. So I've already told you, you know, these kids can experience changes in brain structure and function, changes in a response to rewards, also tend to show greater responses to stress. 
Um, and we know that these kids are at risk for continuing to have depression through their life. So they are not necessarily just going to grow out of it if we don't do anything. Um, and, you know, prior to this early work here that I'm going to show you, we really didn't have any treatments for this. Okay, so what would we try to do? So uh, we focused on a treatment form called parent-child interaction therapy. Um, and in this uh, study, we recruited approximately 239 kids from the St. Louis area. They were between the ages of three and seven. And they all met criteria for depression and participated in the study. Now, the, the kind of the starting point for this treatment was these two pieces here, child and parent directed interaction therapy. Um, in the field, people refer to this as PCIT, parent-child interaction therapy. And it's actually been used for quite a long time for kids who have um, challenges more to kind of like disrupted behavior, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, you know, difficulties acting out in class and with their peers. It's not been used previously to try to treat early onset depression, but the principles are important. So, you know, in the child directed component of this, it's trying to work with the child to help them learn some self-regulation skills and working with the parent part is really about helping to support parents in effective parenting skills, helping them to learn how to help their child engage in self-regulation. But the new part that we added is the emotion development part, which is really focused on trying to help kids develop better emotion regulation skills, um, both in terms of reducing responses to negative stimuli in their environment, but also hitting on that joy and pleasure piece. How can you help upregulate your responses to positive experiences in your environment? How does this work? So it uses what's called a bug in the ear coaching technique where uh, the child comes in with a caretaker. In our study, it happened to be primarily moms, but there's no reason it couldn't also be dads. Um, and they're working with a therapist and the therapist is going to teach them some skills and then kind of coach the caretaking parent um, on how to interact with their child using a microphone in the ear. So that's why it's called a bug in the ear coaching. Um, okay. Um, and, you know, I think very much so for kids, right? Kids are living in a family and the caregiver really is going to serve as we refer to it as the arm of the therapist or sort of the extension of the therapist. So part of what you're trying to do is is help parents or caregivers develop skills that they can be using in their everyday life so that in some sense the therapy is continuing outside of the therapy, you know, the, the doctor's office and in the home in the everyday life of the child because that's really how it's going to be the most effective approach. Um, and in order to help parents learn how to cope with different events, we use structured, emotionally evocative events around which the parent and the child can interact and learn these skills. And so they're gonna be events that both elicit frustration, so you can help the child learn how to deal with the negative emotions, but they are also gonna be events that should be generating positive emotions, right? So that you can help the parent learn how to help the child upregulate their positive emotions. All right, so this is just an example of our setup. This all happens um, uh, over in one of the buildings on the medical school campus. So uh, we have a central room where the therapist sits and there's a one-way mirror and they can see the, the parent and the child interacting. They've got a microphone and an ear set and the parent is wearing a microphone in their ear and the therapist is coaching the parent while they're interacting with the child to help them to develop skills and to use effective strategies to help the, the child, uh, you know, work on emotion regulation. Okay, so what do we see? Um, oh, I should say, um, this treatment goes for about 18 weeks. So you start by doing the child and the parent part, and then you do the emotion regulation part. The way we did it is that initially kids were randomized either to be in the treatment group or into a waitlist control group. So we would be able to compare what happens when kids are getting treatment versus not. But then all the children in the waitlist control group were invited to come back around and be in treatment. So at the end of the study, every child was offered treatment 
Um, and we're now following these children over time to see how long the treatment continues to be effective, which spoiler alert, there was evidence that it was effective. Um, okay, so how effective was it? So red is the weightless control group and blue are the kids who went through the PCIT emotion development program. And these were the percentage of children after that eight week, 18 weeks of treatment who still met criteria for depression. So the first thing you can see is that in the weightless control group where it was just sort of, they were going on as, as normal, almost 75% of the kids still met criteria for depression after that 18 week waiting period. Whereas only about 20% of the kids in the treatment arm still met criteria for depression. So that's a really, really significant difference between the two arms. Those who got treatment were much less likely to be depressed after that 18 weeks. We also know that it helped children to function better. So this is something called the Children's Global Assessment Scale. So this is a clinician rated measure and the clinicians were blind to what treatment group the kids were in. So they didn't know when they were making these assessments after talking to parents and the children about whether the child was in the weightless control group or the treatment group. Um, and so you can see that prior to treatment, the scores were pretty similar across these two groups and these are kind of low. So this means that these kids are having problems with school interacting with peers, with their family. So this is not doing particularly well. After 18 weeks, there was a bit of improvement in the weightless control group. So those scores went up, but you can see that they went up much, much more in the PCIT treatment group. So the kids who got the emotion development treatment were doing much better after treatment. They were functioning much better, doing better in school, interacting with peers better, you know, less conflict in the family, all of those sorts of things. So in terms of their depression and in terms of their function, they were doing much better after treatment. What about in terms of their brain activity in response to pleasure and reward? So after 18 weeks, we redid that same doors task that I showed you before, measuring electrical activity on the surface of the scalp. And what we see here is the um, amount of change that occurred from prior to treatment to post-treatment. So red is the weight control group, blue are the kids that got treatment. Higher scores here indicate greater improvement or a larger response to information about winning a reward versus losing something. And what you can see is that there was a much bigger improvement or increase in brain responses to rewards following treatment in the kids who got this emotion regulation treatment compared to the kids who are in the weightless control. Now, one interesting thing about this um, that I don't have a slide of, but it, it's, it's work we just did recently. We actually did a third EEG assessment. So we did this measuring this brain activity at the, prior to the start of treatment. Then kids do the parent and the child interaction therapy part, which is the part that's been around for a while. We measured brain activity again, and then they did eight weeks of the new emotion development treatment that was really specifically focused on depression, and then we measured brain activity again. What I'm showing you here is the difference from the prior to treatment to the very end of treatment. But more recently, we went back and looked at brain activity in the middle of treatment before the emotion development part started. And what was really interesting there is that brain activity at that point compared to pretreatment was not different, right? So those initial phases that were more generally focused on, you know, developing some, you know, further parenting skills around general self-regulation with the parent and the kid, but prior to really specifically focusing on emotion regulation didn't change. All the change occurred between starting that emotion development treatment and the end of emotion development treatment, suggesting that there really was something important about that focus on helping kids to learn to regulate their negative emotions and upregulate their positive emotions that was associated with changes in brain activity to rewarding and pleasurable stimuli. All right. Um, now, our hope, as you might guess, is that having done this treatment early on with these kids, that it's going to be effective and that it will continue to uh, help them with their depression and hopefully prevent them from experiencing new episodes of depression. Um, we think this treatment was quite effective. Um, 
it doesn't have any side effects. And that is certainly a huge, huge benefit at any point in life, but it's, it's sort of an extra important benefit when we have young kids. Um, and if it changes the way that the brain processes rewarding stimuli, which we think is sort of a key issue in depression, it also may change now how kids are sort of able to interact with their environment going forward in a way that we hope really helps to kind of promote healthy and positive development. Um, now I'll get on my bandwagon a little bit here. <laughs> um, if you think about return on human capital investment in terms of where we spend our money in terms of treatment and various sorts of things, right? Um, and how much benefit or return we get from that. Um, there's a lot of evidence from sort of health economics that early investments, preschool programs, things that you do very early in life end up really having a much better return on investment in terms of economics than things that we wait to intervene with later on in life. So just kind of putting a plug in here for the importance of at minimum early, early intervention and, and investing in resources that allow us to provide early intervention. But even thinking backwards to things like prevention, right? Can we start to identify kids who are at risk for developing depression or other sorts of things and think about preventative uh, programs that might preclude them from developing depression in the first place, which, you know, we would hope would be even more effective in terms of their long-term positive outcomes compared to, you know, even intervention once they've developed depression, even if we think that early intervention in preschool is going to be even more effective than later on, right? So just putting a plug in here. Um, we also know that there are a lot of things in the environment, a lot of challenges environment that can make kids more at risk for developing depression. Uh, so one of the big projects that we have going on now is to really understand uh, environmental impacts on kids and their development and defining environment starting all the way back in utero during pregnancy and understanding how stress and disadvantage that mothers experience during pregnancy might be translated into brain development in kids. Um, so we know that mothers who experience stress, inflammation, other negative environmental experiences in pregnancy, you know, they're having their own challenges. We know now that also that relates to children's brain development at birth. And then we wanna continue to look at how uh, you know, stress and adversity early on in the course of life might be shaping brain development with the eye of being able to intervene. And, you know, we've been particularly focused on brain development, but the more we learn about sort of mind-body connections, we know that there are many things about the body that influence the brain. So we know that inflammation um, is something that's really critical for shaping brain development. And we know that stress and adversity actually leads to increased inflammation, both in mothers and their offspring. And we've also gotten interested in the gut microbiome, which also is modified or altered by stress and adversity, and which there's growing evidence may be communicating bidirectionally with the brain in ways that also shape brain development. So uh, really trying to understand both the things that promote healthy brain development across the early years of life and the sorts of things that might be uh, getting in the way and making it harder uh, to develop healthy brains so that we can think again about early prevention or early intervention in a way that help children spend as much time as possible during development, you know, being able to really maximize their resources and their interactions with the environment. All right, so I will stop there um, and I will, uh, I know I see I have some questions in the Q&A chat room here. Um, Daniel, would you like me to read questions so that? Uh, no, I can see them. Okay, here we and go. would you would yeah. you read them out loud? Sure, okay, so. The first question I got, which is a great one, is can you give me some examples of what the caregiver coaching look like? What might, what might a caregiver say in a frustrating, joyful situation? So that's a great example. So say you have a child um, and they're experiencing like a, a, a big one is they've got to wait for something, right? So, you know, you're doing a task for them where they're going to get, you're, they're going to maybe get some 
reward over here, but they have to wait and children can become very frustrated. So what you might be coaching the caregiver to do is um, positive distraction, right? Like, okay, you know, try to get them engaged in doing this other thing that will take their mind off of it. Or, you know, try to get them to engage in some deep breathing techniques or try to help them work with the kids to do some self-talk around, you know, it's going to be okay, you know, um, you know, kids are not particularly good at self-talk. And so helping them to learn how to, what to say to themselves, you know, about, you know, say they were in a, uh, had a bad situation with another kid and they're mad at the kid and they think the kid, you know, did it on purpose, like helping them to think through might be what, what, what might be other reasons why little Johnny didn't want to play with you in that moment. On the positive side, you know, I think a big part of it is, you know, letting kids um, kind of have permission to be joyful, right? And, you know, uh, having parents work with the kids to encourage them to sort of stay, I'm, I'm going to use my adult terms, right? Centered in the moment, right? That we're not going to say that to a kid, right? But like, you know, having that, you know, you might have a kid, you're playing the popping bubbles game, and they're worried that, you know, oh, mommy, you, you know, you should be getting a turn, I shouldn't be getting to have all this fun and helping the parent to say, you know, no, this should be about you. It's okay for you to have fun. It's okay for you to experience this. So there can be a huge range of things, you know, and, and, and parents are really good at this when you help them kind of coach them on this. And I will also say that um, uh, it is the case that if you have a child who's depressed, you are often depressed yourself because it's very, very hard to have a child who's ill um, and any of you who's, who've had an ill child know that. And so one of the other things we see is that the caretaker's depression gets a lot better during the course of treatment as well. And whether that's because their child is getting better and therefore feeling better, or whether some of the emotion regulatory skills that we're teaching them to teach their child are ones that they can also use for themselves, we don't know. Um, next question, please relate the relationship between prevention and the ACE study. Um, uh, so the ACE study is this one here. So, you know, I think one of the things that we are interested in is the idea that, um, you know, kids who experience adverse childhood events, meaning poverty, stress, you know, trauma, um, are at an increased risk of depression and anxiety later on in life. And so the question is, are there things that we can do to intervene early on? So. I'm focusing a lot on sort of biological and physiological things here that might be mechanisms. And in theory, you could think about interventions at the level of the gut microbiome or inflammation. But I could give you a whole other talk about how uh, environmental and family nurturance actually modulates inflammation and the gut microbiome and brain development. So one of the things that we could be thinking about is for kids who are particularly at risk, ways of further enhancing uh, you know, family support, parental nurturing, a, a broader environment in the in the preschool and other places, because we know those things in both actually animal and human studies really have powerful impacts on the brain. So that's how we're kind of linking the uh, prevention and ACE idea is that we know kids who are having these adverse childhood experiences are particularly at risk and are a population where we would really ideally love to be able to do even more intervention. Okay, the next question is, can you use the bug in the ear philosophy for young adults? Help them upregulate. Oh, that's an interesting idea. We have not tried that. Um, uh, I would say that there definitely are some approaches but that are sort of akin to that though now, but using mobile technology. So there's a lot of focus for adults on using um, you know, uh, smartphones and other apps to do something kind of conceptually akin to the bug in the ear, right? Like reminders and prompts to people, ways for them to interact with, you know, either a real human or a bot on their cell phone in ways that kind of give them intervention in the moment in their everyday life. Um, but in theory, you could use a bug in the ear too, if you had enough resources to have a, you know, a human therapist on the other end. Okay, great question. Pandemic seems to be increasing childhood depression. Absolutely. Um, are there any interventions we can do on a broad scale to help very young kids? Um, that's a great, great question. So there's just tremendous amounts of data that 
kids and adults are experiencing increased levels of depression and anxiety due to the pandemic. Um, you know, I think that perhaps one of the things that we could do for everybody, right, is to think about how can you help kids uh, kind of emotion regulate around, uh, you know, that depression and anxiety. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things that's challenging with kids is that kids are very in the moment. Um, and that can be really good in some ways, right, because, you know, they're maybe, you know, a, if it's a healthy kid, maybe they're not so worried about the future. But it also means that it might be more difficult for them to see the end of the pandemic coming, right? And so, you know, one of the things I think we could be doing in terms of that kind of broad scale intervention is really work kind of helping kids to think through the fact that this is hopefully, you know, a, a relatively temporary thing, you know, helping them to develop techniques to manage their frustration when they can't do the things that they normally could do helping them to kind of helping them to anticipate the positive things that are hopefully coming down the road as you know more and more of us get vaccinated and other you know things start to make it so that we can go back to more of our normal life um, so i think those principles could definitely be used on a broader scale um, i am wondering if the participants parents were asked about adverse childhood experiences disruption and attachment and other traumatic events um, we have definitely uh, asked about that we have not looked in this data at the interaction between that and treatment response but that is something we do plan to do we have other studies where we have been looking at um, both moms adverse childhood experiences and the child's you know and it is certainly the case that moms who have had their own experiences with early trauma and early stress you know uh, are more likely to be depressed or anxious and their kids are also more likely to experience adverse childhood experiences so we do think that that's really critical i mean it's kind of a you know we unfortunately have a, a very sort of what's the opposite of a virtuous cycle, right? It's the opposite, right? Where, you know, having experienced stress and trauma yourself, unfortunately means it's probably more likely that your child has also, is also going to experience stress and trauma. Okay, next question. Is there any hope that children in these cases get to a place where they can be considered cured? Is there a spiritual dimension to humans with a mind and a body component? Um, so the cure part, that's what we're trying to look at right now so we are continuing to follow these kids over time to see you know whether they you know don't develop depression again uh, is it everybody who doesn't develop depression is there something that tells us which kids still go on to have more depressive episodes so we we hope that that you know i i'm always hesitant to be um over claiming but we would love for it to be a cure and that's what we're trying to see right now um i do think it is probably likely that cure is going to be too strong of a word and that we may need to think about things like booster sessions that occur over time for families to help um you know kind of remind everybody of the positive emotion regulation and parenting skills that they've learned um but we'll know more about that in a year or two um is there a spiritual dimension to humans with a mind and a body? That is a great question. It's not something that, that we have looked at in our own research or that I personally have a lot of knowledge about, but uh, I do have colleagues who are very interested in that. Um, uh, in terms of the gut microbiome connection, have you looked at pain in the gut as a trigger to stress and ultimately inflammation and depression? No, but that is another great question. Uh, I'm involved in another study where we just started to include pain measures um, and partly to kind of look at that, um, you know, because there is some evidence from some older studies that pain experiences, not necessarily just gut pain, but pain experiences might be associated with uh, greater stress and inflammation and actually increased risk of substance misuse as well. Okay. I think that that is all the questions, unless anybody has any other ones. Uh, yeah, Jan, perhaps I could ask um, one final question. Um, you talked, sure. you talked um, quite a bit about preschool and um, the possibility of environmental factors and um, making those more positive, especially through preschool for kids as a uh, prevention. And it, it's a, diet could be um, similar. 
Um, are there treatment methods or some of the treatment that you're doing that you could imagine being built into preschool for all the kids? Yes, big answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, now I will say that, you know, I think it would be important to do that. I mean, I think that you could imagine a lot of emotion regulatory skills that you could be working with teachers and kids on um, in preschool and in kindergarten. Um, if we could find a way to sort of get in the home though as well, because you know the majority, for most kids, right, the vast majority of the time they're spending with their family, right? Um, and you know, I think one thing that all of us can resonate with is that when families are stressed, you know, it's hard to be your best parent, right? And so I think we need to be thinking about both what are the things that are impinging on families as a whole and how can we support that? And in cases where people need more knowledge about effective, you know, parenting skills and emotion regulation skills, can we not only intervene in the preschools, but also provide resources to parents, right? Um, that would allow them to be engaging in those kinds of effective things at home as well. Um, but, but definitely the principles could, and, and in some cases have been ported to at least the PCIT part, the kind of parent-child interaction, more general self-regulation piece have been incorporated into preschools. I think the emotion development piece is something newer that Dr. Luby developed, and that's kind of an add-on that might be particularly helpful for kids who have difficulties regulating their emotions, either positive or negative. Um, okay, let's see, more questions come here. What differences have you found between one and two? We haven't looked at one versus two parent families in terms of treatment um, as of yet, but that's an interesting question. Um, and then someone also asked, have we established any connections with the parents as teacher program? We haven't yet, but that is actually kind of heading in that direction is where we would like to go next is to think about uh, developing approaches. Uh, Dr. Luby, my colleague, has been developing connections with uh, school districts to try to look at doing PCIT ED in, in schools for kids who are at high risk, uh, but parents as teachers would be another great idea. Um, I have found that very few physicians even know about the ACE study, let alone practice on those principles. Are you doing anything to educate the medical and educational worlds? Uh, so we write papers about this all the time and give talks, um, but you're absolutely right that like a lot of pediatricians are not necessarily aware of this. Um, I I'm actually doing some work with an organization called One Mind, which is a philanthropic organization that does uh, fund uh, work related to um, uh, treatment for mental health challenges. And one of the things that we've been working on is thinking about like early identification with aim towards prevention. And that one of the things that we'd be looking at there is uh, kind of increased information about identifying trauma and ACEs that kids may have experienced so that um, there could be more awareness of that and treatment of it. It's not as much targeting like pediatricians, which would be another important thing to do, but we are trying to partner with like the pediatric community in terms of that. So it might be a way to get some more of that information out there. Um, yes, uh, very great question. What about supporting families in poverty and racism in the larger society? Honestly, if, if I were queen of the world and had control of all the resources, that's exactly what I wanna do. Um, you know, we, we know that poverty has you know, many negative outcomes associated with it and that this is what is causing stress and trauma. And we know that there is intersectionality such that people who are the victim of racism you know, may be sort of doubly hit by discriminatory practices and increased rates of poverty. So honestly, yes, like that is exactly where we need to go. And there, there are actually a couple really fast, I, don't have time to talk about this, but there's a couple really fascinating studies going on around the country right now looking at how um, direct income transfers for single mothers living in poverty might impact brain development in kids to really try to hone in really precisely on at least the poverty part of that question. It doesn't directly address the racism part, but it tries to address the poverty part. All right. I I, is that it for the questions? 
Um, well, I would uh, like to give a final thanks to Professor Barch. Um, feel free to use the Q&A to express your gratitude and she'll be able to see those comments. I also wanna thank you for being with us this morning and for your questions. This is our last MLA lecture for 2021, but I wanna give you a heads up about an exciting group of talks and workshops in July that will be part of our Summer Writers Institute and open to the public. So look for more information this summer. So thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you everybody.